contractors and subcontractors and all service providers. And therefore, that means that that's where the opportunity is to make sure that these contracts are done in Uganda and they are done in accordance with the laws of Uganda. And if there is any clarity and so on, it is also done in accordance with Uganda. If you advise your client to externalize any of these contracts, it means that at any time they are looking for any advice on it, that work will be sold from a barrister or a lawyer from outside. Because we are, we are here, we are specialists in Uganda law. And probably lastly, uh, what I wanted to comment on as a member of law society is that the 16 to 23 services that have been gazetted um, exclusively to be offered by Ugandans is based on the uh, ability of those service providers to provide the services to the industry. Because the industry does not want to compromise quality. The question now, I think the discussion we should start having at our society is whether we have the capacity to offer exclusively legal services to the industry so that the discussion around uh, that debate uh, can be had. As a regulator, I will not uh, give my views because I'm required to advise the minister, but I think conversation should be had. And more specifically, I would encourage um, our members to look at specialization so that you specialize in certain fields in that when these people come, they can be sure that they are getting the right and accurate advice. Um, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sekato. Uh, before I move to uh, Mr. Hanyan, uh, you talked about uh, massive contracting. What would you say is the level of preparedness for the Ugandans to participate in these activities? At least from what you have observed from the time you were set up as the regulator. Um, what I say is information is critical. What we've done is that at every opportunity we've shared um, what is coming, what is required. We require the oil companies to give us their procurement plans annual and we set it out there so that uh, whoever is uh, interested gets the information of what is quite, uh, coming uh, earlier. We should all recognize that this is the first time we are going to do um, involvement of an oil well in this country, so it's a new area, and it does not compromise, uh, uh, there's no compromise on quality and so on. But what we've done is to share the information. I can say that from the last national content reports, um, we are almost at 30 percent Ugandans participating, which is a very commendable um, statistic based on uh, other counties that we've seen. Um, and my view is that for the areas where we have competitive advantage, I think Ugandans are really taking up uh, the opportunity. When you look at the national supplier database, there are many Ugandan companies and we are encouraging joint ventures in the area where you feel you're not strong enough. We encourage companies to go out and look for other people who have done this, then a joint venture and domesticate them. And we've seen a lot of uh, effort along that side. And we are really positive that uh, they are going, they are part and uh, part of this um, industry. Thank you, Ali. Um, Mr. Hamia is. Uh is a teacher, he teaches this particular subject, oil and blood. Um, I know he's dissected Peter's presentation. Uh, and, 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 but as you give us uh, your comments on, Peter, on Peter's paper, what do you also see as, uh, because we are talking about uh, local content rules and regulations, but I think the law still looks at a Ugandan company as a company registered in Uganda. Supposing it is uh, it is owned by by non-Ugandans, but here registered in Uganda, it's a Ugandan company. What are the opportunities there, and where do we land? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mwanusha. Um, thank you, Peter, for your paper. I've known Peter for quite a bit of time. He's a brave, a cold Ugandan together. So, um, 
papers where the structure will be presented. Certain issues that I wanted to raise, one that touches the issue of local content is, one, as a law society, um, it goes back to you as a law society, or goes back to all of us as a law society, and equally, Sekatawa. In the shape, why were legal services not reinforced? That I have going to pick, but for purposes of this, because yes, we are looking at the issues, the opportunities, always the extractive industry. I've told of the Petroleum Institute for the last five years, and I think more than 250 to 300 lawyers have gone through the different five years and the semesters that we've been through. We have three judges and a variety of registrars. And I believe if you look at those who have studied from our, we have the competence to at least address some of the three quarters of what is happening. The, the unique stage of the complex of PSAs and ABCD is, is done. We are at the development stage and in the next five years, if the FID is finally signed in September this year, the next five years of setting up of the refinery, the pipeline, the industrial park, the airport, if we do not get in-house lawyers taking the lead, not just sitting and carrying briefcases of this bazoom, if we do not get lawyers in Uganda taking the lead in providing legal services for this, we are going to get nothing at the end of the day. The oil and gas cycle is rather interesting. Because after this, the pipeline is automated, the refinery is automated, there's nothing else to do. The industries will operate at this. If you get a service and a Mzuku will come here and is charging you in dollars, it's by the way, all this is cost recovery. And it's cost recovery of the crude that you are producing. Then a Ugandan entity is told, come and be our sidekick for purposes of fulfilling local content requirements. The Ugandan entity is told, give me a brief on employment, environmental issues, and employment, environmental issues, and tax. The man sends the brief, he's thrown, if it's so much, $100,000, the Muzong is pocketing two, three, four million dollars, and the man is running around saying he's benefiting from the oil and gas sector. We are getting the short end of the stick. It is our resource. The head of state, I think, last year or the year before, came and asked, task the Attorney General was here, and said, why don't we have lawyers in the Ministry of Justice taking a lead in negotiating most of these things? Why do we still have to contract for it? I, 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 I think I've gone through so many enough. I've gone through so many, and I believe we have the competence it takes to negotiate project financing agreements, to negotiate public-private partnerships, initiatives to negotiate and conclude joint ventures to even do the financial transactions for these ventures and they're not that crazy. Three, four, five lawyers put in a room together, we'll thrash out this document, we'll have it and it will be bankable to any financer. What are we doing? We are giving it out. It doesn't make sense. This is all cost recoverable again. And who is going to pay that cost? You from the crew that you produce. It doesn't make sense. You get the law society, unfortunately, the chairman, the president is here, should either very quickly find a constitutional petition to challenge that provision, why we are being omitted, and to ensure that we get declaratory orders to include us in that brain text. Then you can discuss other things, because that is how then you address the issues and the challenges that we are facing. Another issue is when we get to the talent register. She has left, but we, 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 we have a problem. The very few Ugandans who have been employed by the, the IOCs are paid peanuts. The Chinese, the French, the Muzu, who is employed with less qualification or same qualification is paid thousands of dollars and is given a different, and the, the, the reason is, oh, if you are Ugandan and you are Ugandan, that's what our company policy states. And yet you have an authority regulator, and the regulator is supposed to tell you this is what it is. When you then come
comes to the talent register, if I have two masters from a renowned university and I apply for a job, I should be paid what the international market demands for that position. That is the only way then you'll have a funded Mugwezi send this kid to study. Because you know that at the end of the day that person is going to come and will demand a certain fee for that labor. I must start to be out. When it comes to the education, what Ali was talking about, arbitration and this, the authority needs to go back and review the various institutes and modules that, that are being taught. So then the modules that are being taught to the people who are coming to their LLMs or their MBAs are actually in line with where the sector is going and so they become relevant. Teaching someone, someone comes and does an MBA oil and gas, and I tell the person, but you're not doing petroleum taxation, you're not doing project finance, then how will you advise a company at a board if you have an MBA but you do not have these actual fundamentals? If you're doing the LLM and then you're not doing, you, you, you decide, your, your module doesn't include certain vital elements of petroleum economics, project finance, or this or this. There are certain things that the Petroleum Authority should go back to these institutes that are training and asking what are your curriculum. As much as we know it's you got a higher education curriculum, you as a regulator of the sector, you have a stake in the quality of the labor force that is being churned out that is going to be put into that capital. Last lastly, in respect of this is you said you decent. Um, the way you dismissed um, the dispensation of information is being done and where it should be prepared. The issue is if a company is, gives you its field development plan and it's yearly, this information being given out then helps the different tours and the different people plan accordingly and say, I can apply for this and I can uniquely position myself for that. It becomes very hard if you open the newspaper and you find a call for expression of interest and you have 30 days to beat it up. And yet someone had two months ahead to preempt the quality of who is going to be taken. So we should, they, the Yandalo Society should then try to interface with you and get to know what it is. So we have a whole year plan and you know this is the service going to be provided by the law. This for it's going to be provided by the authority over a period of over a period of one year, then the different law firms can begin to syndicate among themselves. It doesn't, I don't care if Katera Kalkumide and Max and Abma or and whoever match to win a contract, because I know that money, those three, four, five million dollars will stay in our economy. We will not go out of the economy. In respect of the world, the Africa approach. I think the way forward is to build forward and backward linkages within the extractive industry. We should drive, we should drive patriotism in the management of our extractive industry and resources. These are our resources. You'll never find a rich man going to see a poor person, never. But we have the Chinese and the whites running to Africa and then they call us poor. We are rich. We just do not want to manage a resource patriotically to your own benefit. Not to the benefit of that guy who is coming in to tell you wonderful things. We have the Africa Continental Free Trade Area that's being launched in July. I've done a bit of work for the AU. And it's another way we can boost intra-Africa trade. Within Uganda, looking at the byproducts from the, the, the forward and backward linkages from the refinery exploitation of the continental free trade area that has been ratified by 22 African states is very key in getting us that market. Our refinery is a 60,000 pound refinery. Ministry of Energy currently states that our consumption per day of crude stands at almost 35 to 39,000 barrels. By 2030, we shall be hitting 50,000 or 60,000 barrels per day domestically. If you, look, if you look at the East African Refining Report, it says 
by 2040, we shall be looking at 80,000, 100,000 barrels. So equally then to the National Oil Company, we are looking at 60,000 barrels. But if it is, um, it, because the, mod, the, the refiner is a modular refiner, that okay, it's a hydro, mild hydrogen product. And if this is, you are speaking, so, sorry. <laughs> Depending on the configuration of the refinery, we should be able to ramp it even past the 6,000 barrel refinery. There are issues regarding the current consortium and its financing, whether we are going to have that financing source from the US stock exchange, and if it's done, God forbid, that then disorganizes our sector. Because then, you cannot have a Muslim tell you, human rights in Uganda, your stock falls, your stock falls, your project becomes, your, the bankability of your project is affected, you're done. We are in line that. So the management of the refinery, heavily, that 60%, we should ensure that the financing is well structured and we are not getting debt off listed companies. Because then the requirement for listing is, is another different ball game and corporate governance issues. Lastly, Lawyers need to take a global perspective and approach to how we're going to do business. We should stop just thinking in our small cartoons, but still we should look at it in a better perspective. I can merge with Nalu, I can merge with Asmahani as, as and this to win a bid because we can bring our competences together. We are stronger together and we are better united. So let's first fight this animal called ring fencing. Let's get ourselves onto that list of ring fenced entities and service providers, then we can deal with it. Because that is then why a lawyer will pay for another person within the farm or out of the farm to go and study. Because he knows there is a niche that is being catered for in that market. Thank you, sir. Uh, you are about to make my moderation difficult <laughs> because I was listening to the issues. You've raised uh, many, many critical issues. I will um, ask uh, uh, Peter to respond to some later and argue, but first, let me hear from a practitioner's perspective. Dorothy, your comment. Uh, thank you so much, Moderator, and thank you, Peter, and all the panelists for uh, well thought of discussion. Mine is a challenge to us lawyers. We are listening to all these numbers. The big bills are about to come in. And uh, the resources here with us, we cannot afford to postpone it anymore. So at a personal level, what are you doing to ensure that you actually don't miss out? The good thing about this industry is that it traverses sectors. You may be in construction, you may be a construction law practitioner, a land law practitioner, but what effort have you put in to make yourself